there remains an ongoing presumption within the law of the 41st millennium that the Primarch of the Imperial Fists is dead. However, it is also true that like many things that span the bridge of time between the end of the heresy and the Indomitus era of the Imperium, all that has occurred across this void remains very often unclear or immersed in the deeply muddied waters of Imperial records. Then of course for ourselves, stepping back from the full immersion of in-fiction narrative, there are the diegetic and extra-diegetic accounts which provide conflicting versions of events, which it must be noted is relatively unusual for a Primarch's end. The Emperor's Primarchs are usually either confirmed living in some form, confirmed dead, or lost. While the lost option may seem equally ambiguous as is true of Dawn, it's more grounded to my mind. For example, a Primarch who is lost has very obviously disappeared in some sense. They have been noted as leaving of their own volition. But there remains still every possibility that they could return. So while the Khan, Korax and Rus are technically missing, they are presumed, unless confirmed otherwise, to be alive. Although in the case of Korax, it has also been suggested his extended time spent hunting traitors in the warp may well have mutated him into something entirely detached from his previous form, which is both vague and troubling and interesting. Then you have Gilliman and the Lion. Both were in a state we knew to be alive in a manner of speaking, and Gilliman's situation in some respects was more precarious than the Lion, yet both have now returned to the Imperium in M41. By contrast, those who are recorded as dead are generally speaking considered to be permanently retired. They are known to have been killed. Conrad Kurz of the Night Lords, Sanguinius of the Blood Angels, Ferris Manus of the Iron Hands, Alpharius of the Alpha Legion, and of course Horus himself. And yes, there is still a question mark when it comes to Horus now, but it's so incredibly vague as to barely warrant discussion at this specific moment. But effectively, those are the permanently retired Primarchs at this point. Then there is Vulcan of the Salamanders, who, whilst technically dead, of course has a slight caveat, which is that given his perpetual nature and the fact that he has died and returned several times, it seems entirely likely that he will return at some point. And I think that's honestly inevitable and it totally works within the law. There's no problems. As for most of the traitor Primarchs, they would transition into becoming a demon prince of chaos. So Fulgrim, Perturabo, Angron, Mortarion, Magnus, Lorgar. These are all ascended. Although one thing I always note, and interestingly, Lorgar remains the only Primarch to take the position of an undivided demon prince of chaos, which is a rare and arguably powerful position because he's a little bit more independent. Yet interestingly, it is always Abaddon who is positioned as the primary leader of the forces of Chaos Undivided against the Imperium, which again, intriguing when we might imagine that Lorgar could take that role. But that's because largely with Lorgar he sort of disappeared, went out of sight into a self-imposed isolation for a considerable period of time. But he still might return, given the description of his return in an 8th edition Chaos Codex, which states that the Great Rift boils across the sky, rumours persist that Lorgar has finally ended this self-imposed confinement and has been seen walking the mortal realms in a terrible splendour, preaching the word of chaos at the head of a word-bearer's force of shocking strength and conviction. Which to me is pretty exciting. I know that Lorgar is often kind of looked down upon because he never had such a strong character as many of the other traitor Primarchs, coupled with, of course, his kind of humiliation at the hands of the Emperor. He never really recovered from that. But I also like to imagine the return of Lorgar at the head of this immense word bearer's force in all of his chaos, Prince Grandia, and undivided at that, which means probably more similar to his human or demigod human incarnation than many of the other traitor Primarchs who are obviously incredibly twisted and distorted because they are more aligned with a specific Chaos God. But then you have Rogal Dawn, the Praetorian of Terror, Primarch of the Imperial Fists. Dawn stands alone and separate from the other Primarchs, to my mind, because his situation is considerably more unclear. And there is arguably enough material out there that he could be alive or dead. 
And I want to be clear from the start, for all of my joking around that I often have, I truly have nothing against Dawn. His story is pretty epic, and his role in the heresy, similarly. But he is like so many of the Primarchs, a figure who was dealt a rough hand from the outset. An astonishing creation of humanity, but also a deeply tortured, troubled character who achieved so much in his time, but ultimately was placed into a situation that was in many ways an unwinnable one, forced to suffer at the end in the name of the Emperor. And while it's technically true that the Loyalists emerged as the victors of the heresy, I think it's always worth remembering that this really was a Pyrrhic victory. I doubt that Rogel Dawn really saw the end of the heresy as a glorious victory. Yes, Terra was saved to a degree, but not the Emperor. The devastation generally that had been wrought all across the Imperium was beyond all estimations, and by any measure, it was a very slim technical victory. Now, despite this video being themed around Dawn, I'm not looking to retell the story of Dawn today. Because what I want to consider is in fact the broader impact of returning characters. But I think that this is best explored using that vehicle of Dawn as a character. Why? Because he sits in this curious position of being quite clearly dead, which we'll come to, but still also maybe not. Now I can already hear those of you consumed by the fire of cynicism, furiously typing, it's about the miniatures. Yeah, we know. Literally everybody knows, okay? So just, just sit down, take your seat. It's okay. It's incredibly, incredibly obvious that whenever Games Workshop might need some kind of surefire financial win, a returning Primarch is going to be a solid gold winner. It's the ace card to keep up your sleeve. This is very clear, it's not a groundbreaking observation. However, returning characters with only that in mind is, in my opinion, a risk. But again, this is not complicated thinking here, it's only a slightly more nuanced concept to understand. Basically, there's always a danger that when you begin returning characters, it cheapens and diminishes the weight of their narrative journey and beyond. Because as per the title, I think over time, a sense of diminishing returns begins to appear with every lost or dead figure who returns, because there have been others already in 40k. Now, a good example would be something like Star Trek or many other ongoing TV serials, whereby if a character within the show suffers a horrible death within an episode, 99% of the time, the audience is barely moved to feel any emotion, no matter how good the performance of the actor or the severity of how they're killed. Because we understand, yeah, that guy's not going anywhere. He's a core part of the crew, he's not going anywhere. Which is why in the first season of The Next Generation of Star Trek, when Tasha Yar was killed, that was a genuine shock to the audience. And it still has impact today, because I've seen recently people who are getting into Next Generation on YouTube stunned that a major character could be killed off, not believing it right until the end of the episode. And that's because it is so unusual for that to happen. Now we all know that the character of Yar in TNG wasn't killed off because of a narrative masterstroke or because they wanted to break the mould. The actress just wanted out of the show and would return later in another seasons and roles. Nonetheless, the impact of that character being killed off in the first season is demonstrable, just as in some others, like for example, The Walking Dead. Now, tedious and annoying as that show is, and the fact that the writers and producers just ran it into the ground with a spectacularly poor choice and understanding of structure and delivery, one positive was that they maintained a fairly unusual sense that just about any character could die at any time which gave a lot of weight and interest and anticipation for the audience. And it also helps to keep everything more grounded. Anyway, my point is just simply that if a character is capable of being removed, killed within a show, it holds a sword of Damocles over all, which does make it more exciting. Now, within 40k, I think we already know that this is only partially true. At this point, lesser characters are more than vulnerable, but major figures? very debatable. And that in itself is a problem, and it's a problem for another discussion, really. But an example to my mind would be something like Manaeus Kalgar. As you all know, I've had an Ultramarines Force since I was a kid. I've explained this and why before. Should Kalgar have died upon Vigilus? Absolutely, in my opinion. It made perfect sense, and it would have made that entire campaign considerably more dramatic and resonated more strongly throughout the historical timeline of the 40k verse. That Vigilus, that was when K 
Kalgar died. But now it's just another battle that happened throughout the Imperium. Totally forgettable, really. Which is a shame to me because it's actually a very well-constructed scenario and campaign within 40k and having something like Kalgar die at the end there would have really cemented it as this important event to remember. Another that I would have enjoyed to see and I still say would have been both narratively dramatic but also very funny if Dante had died during the conversion process to Primaris. He lives all this time manages to survive through all the battles and then just dies on the operating table that would have been pretty amazing to me but again the fact that almost any major character did not die in the process of converting to Romeris for me personally that reduced the narrative weight and impact of that entire ongoing event really the Primaris conversion process it was supposed to be very severe it was a big deal when they were first talking about it and then it just kind of became whatever I think at least one major character should have been sacrificed at the altar of Primaris conversion. It would have made that entire chapter in Astartes history a little bit more memorable, a bit more significant. But to return to the general concept here, if you end up creating a conveyor belt of returning characters who are effectively already permanently retired and have been for not just years but very often decades, and then to return them with a cynical disregard for all other considerations other than is it going to fly off the shelves, well then, yes, you may be making a good business choice, but you're also at high risk of damaging the broader significance of not just that character, but all events within the law. Which, to be clear, may not have a major impact initially, but in the long term, it very well could. Now, is there any example of this really happening in 40k so far, some ongoing returning characters just one after the other? Not really. But that is exactly my point, because it means it's not too late to avoid stepping onto that path where we begin to see returning any and all just for the sake of it. Again, for me, in terms of potentially undermining the narrative weight of other characters broadly by their implausible return, Dawn is the figure positioned to have the greatest impact in that regard. I'll also say that while the lion for me was clearly a very plausible, acceptable return of a character, Gilliman I can't deny was a little bit grating. On the one hand, his return was very necessary and well meshed within other events of the time during the Gathering Storm, and obviously as somebody who likes Ultramarines, that was something that I always wanted to see, so that was great. But the strange alliance between the Eldari and the Imperium, for somebody who is quite invested in the lore, it did stretch credibility to the limit. It's not to say that the Imperium and other Xenos don't sometimes ally, it's just that most often this usually is in an unspoken battle-based scenario where they tend to see one another in a theatre of war and choose to ignore one another to focus on the greater threat to reduce a more significant danger before then just parting ways. Plus, there are, of course, Inquisitors just always doing their own thing out there. That's something else entirely. But the mixture of figures who brought about the return of Gilliman, it definitely was walking very close to the line. Which is, of course, what spawned endless Gilliman Ivrain memes. Now, given the status of and confirmations we understand surrounding Dawn, if we were to see his return, I think, personally, it would chip away a little more of that veneer of sincerity when it comes to the lore. Thankfully, there have not been so many instances of characters returning from the dead that it stretched suspension of disbelief to the extreme. But if anything, I do think something even of the opposite is true. Yarek, for example. Commissar Yarek, one of the most beloved and strongly established figures in the Imperium, and obviously specifically in the Militarum, rumoured dead? Missing from the Codex? A pretty lightweight community article well over a year ago saying, yeah, maybe he's dead, whatever. It's difficult to believe that Games Workshop could have underestimated the strength of feeling about such a long-standing figure as Yarek being killed and effectively off-screen, which makes me believe that Yarek is not in fact truly dead. It's rumoured, and that does lean into the existing nature of the 40k verse, that rumours are heard far across the Imperium, where in actuality the truth is entirely the opposite. It's completely plausible that a senior figure could be lost, miscommunicated as dead, or genuinely believed to be, and then return. So, I hear you say, why not Dawn? As I said elsewhere this week, it's because for me personally, I think somebody such as Dawn carries a lot more weight 
with his character. There's a lot more precedent and significance in that happening. And so to see him return means setting such a precedent, making it so much more established that this is a thing that can happen, therein also making the significance of any and all other character deaths more diminished. Because if Dawn can return, then surely anyone can. Because I will note one other significant example of this, and one for me, again, personally, I would not have indulged in. Inquisitor Sabathiel. Now, to be clear, again, I greatly enjoy Inquisitor Sabathiel. She is both comical and terrifying. The novel which saw her return, Awakenings, actually a really good story. I mean, spoilers, but again, for myself, I really find it hard when a character has been destroyed, and in the case of Sabathiel, point blank by Grey Knights shooting her down for consorting with demons, knowingly or not. That wasn't a situation where she was surviving her wounds. They killed her. Except people often remember the death of Sabathiel at the end of this series at the hands of the Grey Knights, and they forget the final page. And the final page, again, spoilers, we see Sabathiel suspended in the warp and a greater demon of Zinch. Which is, of course, highly suggestive that she is now a minion for Zinch, whether she realizes it or not. Now, really, my overall point is, regardless of that, the death of Sabathiel, although open-ended, for me, it did erode a little more of the gravitas when a character dies in 40k. Because now, just as in a TV show, you're seeing a major character killed, it rings hollow. Because in your mind you're thinking, okay, they seem to be dead, but maybe they're not. I mean, Sabathiel was effectively revived by some means or other. She was floating and then she was discovered and healed. And the beginning of that was very, very vague about how she ended up coming back to the fray, effectively. But again, if all that's required to bring characters back is warp shenanigans, it just kind of opens things up to basically anybody returning. And that really grates on me, because despite 40k being well known for its considerably over-the-top nature, and no matter how much some people want to argue it, 40k does also maintain a serious tone within much of the narrative side of the law. And as you well know, I enjoy approaching the law more seriously. But that doesn't mean that it's not stupid, because for example, there are many fantastic sci-fi movies, which I won't list, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. You could take your pick from a huge range. I mean, you could talk about Dread, you could talk about John Carpenter, stuff like The Thing, or Escape from New York. Ridiculous films in many respects, but also played absolutely straight. And when something is really ridiculous, but also approached from a really serious point of view, that often allows it to work, and also for me personally, very, very, very enjoyable. So it's not that you're not aware that it's kind of crazy and out there and ridiculous, you're totally aware of that, but it's just choosing to approach it from a more serious point of view. And so having characters just ping back into existence wherever you want to, it grates, it's pretty annoying. And yes, having characters return enables you to have new stories, new adventures, new interactions with other characters which are interesting. Sure, all of that stuff is good, but I would happily do without all of that to maintain a sense that when a character dies, there is significance and weight to that event. That to me is significantly more important. And just because there is all this mad, crazy stuff which can occur within specific Xenos factions or just events that occur within 40k, you know, mad characters like Trazin and so on and so on, it doesn't mean that you can just ignore the written style and seriousness that exists within a lot of the authored works of 40k. To do so is quite flippant and just very disingenuous. It's just that stylistically all that mad stuff is a defining feature of 40k, very over the top by its nature. But it also has very human, gritty, serious explorations of characters. Just choose from any within the Warhammer Crime series, which is a really ongoing favourite of mine now. And this isn't about canonicity either, because as I've said before, it really doesn't change my feelings about that whatsoever. And there will be those who, no matter what, will only ever see 40k through the lens of it being this big meme verse where anything goes. That's fine, that's totally valid. But it's also beside the point, because no matter how somebody else sees 40k, personally, the verse itself is anything but tonally mutually exclusive. 40k can be mad and absurd, and brutally dark and comical, but if you acknowledge that, 
you also have to accept that it's often incredibly serious and emotionally gut-wrenching. And it needn't be all about the heresy. The Triumph of St. Catherine, for example, which details the journey of a young sister of battle who is overwhelmed by her duty and the sheer weight of expectation placed upon her. It's very emotionally powerful, it really got to me. Almost any of the narrative in the crime series, like I said, and as I've said previously, even in the new stuff, multiple journeys of individual figures within that Dawn of Fire series. But it's everywhere in 40k, is my point. And what is important for me is that because that seriousness, that investment you make with characters, in their death, they have weight narratively. But once you start returning characters under the slightest pretext with regularity, or simply because it's a business decision, you're going down a very, very dangerous slippery slope there. Because any verse can handle the return of the odd character to some degree. But the more prevalent it becomes, it will ever increase the erosion of drama and investment and significance felt by the loss of a character. Effectively, you're becoming a bit of a soap opera. That is a very bad thing, because it takes us towards this road where you just end up not caring about what happens. Oh, they died, maybe they'll come back in the future. Instead of, oh my god, that character is gone. What implications will this have? And again, I could list reams of examples, but I'm sure you can think of some yourself. I mean, Doctor Who is just a perfect example. The Doctor's regenerations used to have some weight, some significance, because you understood they were a limited number of regenerations available for the Doctor. But then they just got rid of that because they were like, hey, no, we just want to be able to make as many Doctors as we want forever and ever and ever. So now it kind of doesn't matter, whatever. And it's the same way that concepts of a multiverse also can diminish the weight of events happening. Yeah, sure, that thing happened, but maybe it didn't depending on if we want to reboot the series or refresh it or rewrite the character. You can get away with that kind of thing a couple of times, but once you go too far, it starts to fundamentally undermine the weight of everything in a verse. And that undoubtedly is a very, very, very bad thing. You end up with an audience who become kind of passively interested, just don't really care, not particularly invested anymore, and you just start alienating people. It is not a good road to go down. Now, I have outlined the fundamental problem here. I've laid out my case as to why we should allow Rogue or Dawn to remain dead. But what, in fact, is the actual situation with Dawn in terms of the law? How did he disappear? And if at some point they did decide for him to return, is that incredibly jarring and a law whiplash? Or is it able to be smoothed away with a minimal suspension of disbelief? Well, for one thing, in terms of the law, Dawn's disappearance or death does not even have an agreed upon date. This is not unusual for the Imperium though, and within the disappearances of the Primarchs. Certainly not for many figures of the chaotic times in the post-heresy era. But this is the very old law, where it talks about Dawn's skeleton being embedded in amber, etc, etc. This is the very old law novels, the very first kind of 40k novels. You really can pretty much dismiss that. If you wanted to dismiss it in fiction, it was a wild rumour that was heard at one time, blah blah blah, something like that. Really the core of what people look to is in what's called the Index Astartes. This was an old but still relevant source which covered really some of the first extended detail we had about many of the Space Marine chapters and their history and even traitors. And that is still in many ways a definitive bedrock of Astartes lore. It describes how in the pursuit of Perturabo, Dawn and the Fists were so equally pitted that neither side could gain an advantage. And eventually the Ultramarines intervened in this conflict. Gilliman had concluded that the destruction of Perturabo was not worth the loss of Dawn. And so the Ultramarines saved Dawn. Hey look, it's just the lore, don't get angry at me. Soon after, the Fists began their reorganization, fielding successor chapters as the Codex required. Dawn used this time to embrace the Codex, and in the period after, only the Ultramarines stood as a more adherent chapter. Now, even in the Index of Studies, the final chapter of Dawn is confusing. It speaks about Dawn acquiring a store of goodwill in his service to the High Lords of Terror. Basically, this is alluding to the fact that after the heresy, there was a lot of confusion and nobody really knew who to trust, and so a lot of the loyalists had to kind of earn back that trust from humanity and now the High Lords of Terror when the Emperor was not there. But then it also speaks about the Age of Apostasy, which occurred in M36, very long after the heresy. It's not entirely clear if this is written as indicating their status as a chapter and that it just 
had impact much later. They built up goodwill up until the Age of Apostasy. Because the way it's written, though, is in a very concurrent way to the descriptions of Dawn and the Fists in the aftermath of the Heresy. The reason it gets even more confusing is that Dawn's final sighting was aboard a Despoiler-class ship. Now, this class of ship was first seen in M36, so those two details align. But the disappearance of Dawn soon after Korax and other descriptions make altogether less sense because that's much earlier. So it's quite a mess, and it really doesn't read in an easy-to-understand way. Anyway, it speaks also about Dawn outliving many of his brother Primarchs. Just the phrase outliving is a strange one as well, because that kind of implies death by natural causes, which is not at all the case for any of them. It's clearly dated lore, as it makes little sense, but it's the phrasing which is really the problem. Again, it states that soon after the disappearance of Korax of the Raven Guard, the Imperial Fists were asked to help against a Black Crusade against the Cadian Gate. This is an unnumbered Black Crusade. Dawn brought their mobile fortress, the Phalanx, and the majority of the chapter. The Imperial Fists end up here being overwhelmed, again, surprise, but Dawn is determined to, of course, inflict as much damage as possible, whatever the cost. It then states that he made his final stand aboard the ship Sword of Sacrilege, and this is that despoiler-class ship. Dawn said to lead a desperate assault on the bridge. The Chaos Forces did not assault Cadia, the Imperial Navy arrived in force, and alongside Astarte's ships routed this Chaos fleet. The Imperial Fists were able to board the ship that had last seen Dawn, and this is where they famously recover his fist, all they were able to discover of his remains. And this then continues into the legend that the Hand of Dawn is this massive engraved skeletal hand maintained in stasis. It's their holiest artifact for the Imperial Fists. Within the oldest lore, that's how things stand. It's pretty ambiguous. Now I do want to be clear. I have read and seen people say and state that in this reference of the Index is where Dawn met his death. But why? If you read the Index, nowhere does it say Dawn actually died. It states he made his final stand and that the Imperial Fists could not locate him and that they had to fight without him. But it doesn't say he died. This is basically the singular defining description given of Dawn and his end for the longest time. And if it had been left at that, I think you could very plausibly argue that Dawn could have returned without too much fuss. I probably wouldn't be making this video because there's no direct description of him meeting an end. But unfortunately, as is often the case when it comes to the law and investigating the law, if you were to just take that quote, which is often stated online many different places, if you were to just take it as read, you would think, well, it doesn't say that Dawn died. You need to read on. Because about one page later within the index, there is a description. And what that description says is, in reference to the Imperial Fist's use of the Pain Glove, the tool which they use to strengthen their link with the Primarch, the phrasing is very specific. It says, Considering the circumstances of Rogal Dawn's eventual death, it is clear that the Imperial Fists have a drive for self-sacrifice they must continually battle to overcome. It couldn't be more clear, Rogal Dawn's death. And then, to make matters worse, enter Conrad Kurz. Kurz is, of course, the infamous Primarch of the Night Lords, one of the most bloodthirsty and nightmarish of the Primarchs. Kurz was, again, a tragic figure, twisted, not entirely dissimilar to Angron in some respects by just a horrible human world. And then later beyond this just became a crazed figure mentally broken by the madness of the galaxy and the hypocrisy of the Emperor and basically the entire Astardi's Imperium project. His fall to chaos seems again very like Angron to have been almost inevitable. Now in terms of what we're talking about, Kurz takes the status of Dawn and brings it into clearer status. And this isn't a singular reference, it's several references, remembering that for myself, the more something is seen and or spoken to, the more we can support the belief that it has happened, especially if there is nothing which contradicts that. This is generally how I see the concept of whatever qualifies as canonicity for 40k. Again, you know what I think about that. Still though, it's Kurz, so applying a reasonable level of scepticism is probably fair enough. Now, this first reference appears fairly recently, in fact only about five years ago. It's in the Conrad Kurz Primarch's novel whilst he's speaking to his assassin, and he states, I wonder, 
Could you see all the ends of my brothers as I did? Did you see Dawn torn to pieces, Sanguinius cut down, the Gorgon beheaded by his most beloved brother? If you did, you're a far worse monster than I. So that's the most recent reference from Kurz that we have about the end of Dawn. But the more commonly referenced piece of lore, and when I say more commonly, I mean that's requoted by others. Somebody sees it and then requotes it over and over again. Is a piece of lore when Kurz has a vision of Dawn's death, which further supports not only this later, more recent description, but also the fact that this is something Kurz has seen. Now, this reference is four years prior to the Kurz Primarchs novel. And this vision is something, like I say, I always see people mention about, but they never remember where it's from. Well, I'll tell you where it's from. It's from the novella The Prince of Crows, which was first seen in the heresy anthology Shadows of Treachery, and it later came out as an audio short as well. This is where we get the actual vision of Dawn from Kurz, as his fellow Primarchs arrive upon his homeworld with the Emperor. The first demigod, clad in rough gold, inclined his white hair head in a majestic acknowledgement, a king greeting an equal. I am Rogal Dawn, he said. The Night Hunter said nothing. In his mind's eye, he saw the giant die. Dragged down by a hundred murderers in a dark tunnel, their knives and swords wet with warrior's blood. Now, although in terms of the actual text, it doesn't say Dawn was dragged down, but he's looking at Rogal Dawn. He says he saw the giant die speaking to Dawn. So he's having a vision of Dawn. It is, of course, important to bear in mind this is, like I said before, a precognitive vision from Kurz. In saying that, despite it often said that Kurz was cursed by always seeing the worst possible outcome in his visions, because often he's seeing quite far into the future, and as we've discussed previously, this is where the concept of time and the strands of fate comes in, or as the Emperor Malkador would have it, their configurations, and I've talked about that recently about 40k and time, go check that video. Nonetheless, Kurz is fairly reliable when it comes to his visions, surprisingly. One other small thing. Before Kurz, from more recently a release perspective, reaffirmed this belief, this notion that Dawn was dead, in the Imperial Fist Codex of the 8th edition, it did restate that his hand was the only remnant of the Primarch and that his status was unknown. Good to know, but this really doesn't change anything, it's just another detail. Also, given that it's within the Fist's Codex, to me, Codexes always have a little bit of narrative bias. Then lastly, I will mention we have Vulcan, okay? Vulcan makes an offhand reference to Dawn during the War of the Beast, again in M32, so this timeline's being a bit weird. This is when the rediscovered Primarch Vulcan stated to Captain Corland of the Imperial Fists that he would speak well of them to Rogal Dawn. It's really just another oddity of timing, and it does little to alter much of the perspective seen from M41 because it's just a really unusual offhand remark and it could be interpreted a hundred different ways. So that leaves us with Dawn's status really relying upon Conrad Kurz. And despite Kurz being a crazed murderer, it's very questionable what he would have to gain, but then is he confused? Then is the question of Kurz reliable? It's just very debatable. I think a general overarching theme with Kurz is his need to reaffirm his worldview through the despicable nature of humanity, and this also extends to his visions. My point being, the descriptions Kurz gives in relation to Dawn do little to alter his view of things one way or the other. So maybe he's not seeing his sort of personal preference, however that comes to him, maybe he is just seeing it straight as it is. I guess if you were thinking about how he describes Dawn's death, I suppose it reaffirms to Kurz that humans turn on one another like animals and slaughter them. Is Dawn's death so significant that Kurz would need it to be true? Debatable. So very obviously there is a lot of ambiguity when it comes to Dawn. And while some would argue that as a popular character with a heavily established presence within the history of the Imperium, it would make perfect sense for him to return somehow. And I can understand that. And I think in terms of the plausibility of Dawn's return, it's certainly no worse than Sabathil or Gilliman. However, for the reasons I've covered, I still believe he does more good for 40k by staying dead, caveat, for now. I will also say that there's additional exterior reasoning, which for me points to the fact that Games Workshop is not looking for Dawn to return, 
despite the fact that there is obviously kind of gaining momentum with the idea that Primarchs will steadily return now. One is statements by authors that they wanted to kill Dawn, but were not allowed to. As is often the case with the law, they tend to leave breadcrumbs or a foot in the door, perhaps to allow a switchback if were needed, which is kind of how a lot of the stuff about Dawn's End is phrased. It's kind of open a little. And Games Workshop does also have a habit of dropping hints to us by steadily reaffirming things. They're giving you a wink of like, this is what we're doing. And that's why when it comes to the law of 40k, you do need to look everywhere. You need to look into the Warhammer crime stuff. You need to look into campaign books. You need to look into supplementary material. You need to look into new stuff, old stuff. Because even if it's a very small, single statement of an obscure supplement or novel, what matters often with the 40k law is, like I say, the restating of details. The more something is stated, the more you can know and perhaps speculate that this is in fact the truth, the reality, or where something is going toward. And within the law, this is usually a good barometer if they're looking to make any change or not. If something that was written 20 years ago or 30 years ago is restated a decade later and then six years after that, and then very recently again, it's fair to say they probably aren't looking to change it. No matter how much people are talking about whatever it is. Historically, Games Workshop do tend to pretty much flat out ignore community pressure for almost anything, and especially when it comes to the narrative. So I wouldn't foresee that being a factor either. They tend to have a very strong feel of what they want things to be and where they want it to go, and they pretty much just do that. So my point is, having Kurz reaffirm the fact that he's seen Dawn die across the span of basically a decade of narrative, it's not rock solid, but it's certainly more conclusive to me of their intentions regarding Dawn. You know, they've said twice, he's dead. So to just restate, I think the importance of a vague but powerful figure such as Dawn remaining dead does as much good for the law as it would in the eyes of some who would wish to see him return. Because we really don't want to end up in a soap opera scenario where we end up just doing heresy too, do we? Maybe we do, maybe some of you want that. For me, personally, I'd pass. I would like newer things. I am certainly not looking to have Horus somehow coalesce in the warp and rise from the dead. Please, just no. My other soap opera idea is though, Dawn returns, maybe he's got amnesia. Maybe everyone starts having amnesia now too if we're starting to just resurrect characters willy-nilly. Or Gilliman comes back to McCrag one day, busts in, confused to find Dawn here, and then Ivrain appears. Dramatic music, camera zoom in. But this is kind of my point. If you keep going with anyone just returning from the dead, coming back in, it starts getting silly. Because ultimately, when you're world building, creating a living verse, there truly has to be a sense of permanence. Otherwise, the threat of any end steadily becomes ever less meaningful. And I've already expressed my displeasure at the likes of Sabathiel returning. It doesn't matter that the novel of her return was decent, because you could have written a decent novel about anything. Her death was also decent the first time around, and it could have been left at that. The original tale of her was she's an inquisitor, blinded by her desire to ruin the Dark Angels. She's got the blinkers on, and in so doing allowed herself to be manipulated by chaos. That was the whole point. She was tragically flawed, perfect example of what goes wrong when somebody has too much power. She should have stayed dead, in my opinion. And again, that's despite the fact I kind of like her as a character. I think another question for this though, is what would be an acceptable reason and value in Dawn's return? The Imperium is in a terrible state of affairs, it's true, but so far we haven't even had the Lion and Gilliman reunite. So it obviously makes sense that we end up with one Primarch remaining within the Imperium Sanctus and one Nihilus on a mad crusade. So if Dawn returned, he could carry out either of those roles easily. He and Gilliman never saw eye to eye, but given the state of things, it's pretty fair to imagine that they would be able to overcome that and see the design of the Imperium moving forward. The major problem is, and this is something I want to talk about in another video too, the contemporary law of 40k moves at an absolutely glacial pace. Now, in some respects, this is actually good, as I've said before, because moving too fast while constructing new law is a recipe for disaster go too fast, you will end up in horrible situations, horrible reactive situations, and once it's out there, it's out there. So I am fine with it taking time. 
On the other hand, please let's get on with it a bit. Lion and Gilliman need to meet up. Let's make some plans. Call. Let's go, mate. Sort out the maledictum. Because those Tyranids are still coming. So I think this is a major caveat I would put onto all of this. The only circumstances that I could personally accept with the return of Dawn would be if the broader events within the galaxy were significant enough. Because really, I think that needs to be the case with any major returning character. There has to be stuff happening. This is why it made sense when the Silent King returned, because stuff was starting to happen. So it has to be worthwhile and interesting enough for Dawn to return. Because otherwise, he kind of comes back and then... what? I also think if he were to return, it could be and would make sense perhaps that he could take some form that is different, at least in personality, if not something else. I don't think you could just have Dawn step out from behind a curtain and be like, hello, yep, I'm actually fine, so, Lion, Rabute, what's going on? That would be irritating and honestly miserable. So for me personally, I like this idea that he could return, but is not who he once was. Maybe he's been heavily damaged, he already went through this ordeal during the heresy of being stuck in the desert, now he's been lost for 8,000 years? What if he was damaged and had amnesia or something like this? Maybe he needs to take his own journey, his own rehabilitation or a small crusade. Who knows? So having Dawn return would require a major expansion of other elements within the lore. The chaos with the rift, the strange things going on with Abaddon, Vashtor, Lorgar theoretically could return. Mortarian and Fulgrim are forever on the radar but never seem to really get very far. And then you've got the Xenos, we've got the Necron, the Tyranids, you've got the Inari, all reaching a point of considerable danger with their ongoing schemes and galactic disturbances. There is a lot of stuff to play with there. Again, you could have Gilliman focused on the Rift and what is going on with the Imperium structuring. Maybe the Lion and Dawn focus on some of these other things. As you all know, I've said many times, I really want to see the further exploration of what is happening with the Inari, because that is a pretty major development in terms of what could happen. It obviously won't. Selenesh is obviously not going to die for incredibly obvious business reasons. But what if Dawn, for example, returned at a critical moment, when Ivrain is attempting to unleash the Eldari god? Dawn, somehow, because of interactions or what he's been doing, knows the consequences, although in some respects positive to destroy Slanesh, it could also, you know, unravel the fabric of the galaxy. So maybe Dawn comes in, stops her, maybe sacrifices himself in a proper death, not dissimilarly to Tasha Yar, she comes back so that she can have a proper death. Or what if he just intervenes in some other way? What if he becomes trapped by Trazin and it, or what if it turns out that that's where he's been all along, he's been with Trazin all along? What if Cole ends up making a deal with Trazin and ends up keeping Rogel Dawn himself so that Dawn returns, but like not really? That would be pretty comical. And then there's the constructive option. What about if Dawn returned, he and Gilliman, like I said, settle their differences because they see the state of things and they begin to work together. They begin to fortify, manage the Imperium into an ever more powerful empire. What if we saw things start to build forward slightly more positively with a full expanded developed strategic defense network that can respond more proactively to the worst threats, bolstering the Imperial Guard and all this kind of stuff, leaning more human perhaps. Meanwhile, you can still have your Astartes and everything dealing with the absolute critical issues like the Rift, the Xenos coming in and so on. But there is, of course, another reason as to why things would have to get far, far worse to support the return of Dawn, which is the additional elephant in the room, because there is no doubt that the likes of the Khan and Vulcan will be on their way back at some point. So we would end up in this scenario of whatever hellish reality the Imperium descends into, Gilliman, Dawn, trying to manage everything logistically, strategically. Meanwhile, the Lion maybe is then supported by Vulcan and the Khan, marshalling their abilities as hunters of the enemies of humanity. They scour the stars, launch an ongoing crusade, which also blends in and makes use of the more zealous members of the Imperium, like the Sororitas. The future prospects of 40k are endlessly interesting. And honestly, I just rattled some very general concepts off the top of my head, nothing particularly deep. I think that's something to all think about later down the line. But in terms just of returning Primarchs, how do you feel about this? Do you think a figure like Dawn can make a statement by staying dead, or does it not matter either way? Does the prospect of his return outweigh any negatives that are implied by contradicting law? Tell me in the comments below. Thanks as always for watching, I greatly value all your time and support. I have several other projects on the go for the channel currently that I hope to bring soon, but as always I'll return with more discussion of 40k lore, so I will see you as always in the next one.